Shall we get going? Thanks, Robin, and welcome again to all the participants on the call tonight. Just welcome from WISH, um, which is VIT Sports and Health. Um, without them, without our sponsors, obviously these webinars wouldn't be possible. Um, as all of you know, I head up the running interest group for um, WISH. So if anyone would be keen to join any of the groups, please drop us a, a message in the chat group and we will be happy to contact you afterwards. And um, so follow on from last week, we've had two weeks in a row where we've been discussing the kidneys. Um, last week we spoke about hyponatremia and this week an equally important topic, which has to do with the use of supplements and non-steroidal anti-inflammatories during endurance exercise. So I think we can all agree that injuries and muscle soreness from running, actually from any sport, is inevitable. But instead of taking a break, um, many runners tend to reach for painkillers or NSAIDs since you know, that dreaded word of rest doesn't exist in the runner's vocabulary. Not only does this make recovery more difficult, but frequent use of anti-inflammatories can be quite dangerous. Research has shown that NSAID use is quite widespread amongst especially the recreational runners, but most of them are unaware of the potential risks. Like all drugs, NSAIDs do have benefits, but using them to run through injury and pain to achieve training or racing targets is counterproductive to the long-term health benefits of running. And high usage in endurance runners during training and events should be avoided. To change this culture, more information about the safety of NSAIDs and running is needed. Hence, the choice of my topic for this webinar this evening. In fact, I've heard that London Marathon now advises their runners to avoid using NSAIDs within 48 hours of the race because of the potential dangers. So without further delay, our speaker for this evening will be doing exactly that. She will be educating us on the use of supplements and non-steroidal anti-inflammatories and explain their effects on our kidneys. Before I introduce Dr. Duval, please can I ask that you place any questions in the Q&A box? Not in the chat box, the Q&A box. Okay, so Dr. Duval is a nephrologist or specialist physician um, currently practicing at MediClinic Morningside in Santon. She has published many articles and presented at numerous congresses, both locally and internationally, and taught on many platforms, including VITS's graduate entry medical program. She has also received numerous awards throughout her career. On a personal level, she has an interest in photography, especially underwater photography. Um, in terms of sports, she did like scuba diving and has a rescue diver qualification, and she plays the saxophone and the piano. Clearly, she's a woman of many talents, and I may just convince her to take up running in one of these days. Over to you, Dr. Duval. Great. Thank you, Belinda. Thanks so much for inviting me to chat. So thank you to everyone for um, joining our discussion tonight. As has been discussed, we're going to look at the impact of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory supplements as well as water and all of their effects on the kidney. So I'd like to warn everyone to proceed with marked caution. A lot of the topics we're gonna be discussing tonight are quite controversial. There also is quite a limited number of studies within each group. The reason for this is because previously it was always thought that any new or sudden injury that occurred to kidneys but where kidney function appeared to return to normal on blood tests was that it had no long-term impact on renal function and essentially was not gonna be any problems going forward. This, however, we now know to be false and that every single injury that occurs to the kidney is important for long-term kidney health. And that the more hits or incidences that you have to kidney function, will ultimately impact your long-term kidney function as well, and um, whether you may end up needing dialysis later in life. So just to start with some terms, I'm gonna be discussing the GFR, or what is known as the glomerular filtration rate. And this is an equation that we use to determine kidney function. Classically or traditionally, the GFR is determined using creatinine, but we know that creatinine is very unreliable in athletes, as it is affected by both muscle mass as well as any exercise. 
a new test um, and corrected um, calculation uses the stats and C, which is more reliable, but it is also not 100% accurate. And then lastly, formal GFR studies, which would be accurate, is very difficult to do within the exercise setting and completely impractical to, impractical to do within a marathon setting. Because of the changes in determining your renal function using the GFR, comparing studies has become very difficult. So we have now started looking at what we call renal biomarkers, and they are usually enzymes that we check in urine. Those have also been shown to not be completely accurate within the setting of exercise, particularly long distance exercise and athletes. However, one seems to be promising and that is the end goal. So in terms of all of our topics for tonight, I'm gonna to run through the definition of your types of kidney injury and kidney disease. Look quickly at the physiology, then look at what the impact of dehydration is on renal function, what the impacts of anti-inflammatories are and then supplements. I then will discuss the consequences of acute kidney injuries. What is a new consideration for an age adapted GFR? And then where do we move to from there? So the definitions for kidney injury has actually just recently been changed. And in fact, the publication for the new guidelines came out this month. The reason for this is because previously we discussed kidney versus renal versus nephro, and a whole entire move is now being made towards discussing everything as kidney injury to try and reduce some of the confusion around the topic. So looking at these new definitions, you'll see that an acute kidney injury is an injury that occurs to the kidney and tends to resolve within a seven day period. And immediately you can see the difficulty of using this definition because it discusses using serum creatinine and changes in serum creatinine, which as I mentioned, is not accurate within the exercise setting. We then speak about acute kidney disease, which includes acute kidney injury, but has a much longer period of time and should resolve within a three month period. Here they look at the glomerular filtration rates as well as looking for urinary biomarkers or seeing if there is any protein being leaked in urine. And then lastly, chronic kidney disease is where you have renal dysfunction that occurs for greater than three months, along with decreased urine outputs, a low GFR less than 60 and markers of kidney damage in urine. So in terms of just quickly discussing marathons and acute kidney injury, there are two recent studies that did look at using cystatin C as a um, calculation of the GFR and urinary biomarkers. And the first one was in 2015. And here they had only 16 participants of a 42 kilometer marathon that signed up. Of those 16 participants, 82% had an acute kidney injury. And very importantly that their urine did have features that were in keeping with an acute kidney injury. They also had both an increased kidney injury as well as increased kidney repair biomarkers on the day of the marathon as well as 24 hours afterwards. In 2017, there was a follow-up study that more participants this time and 74% had positive urine um, microscopy for acute kidney injury. 55%, however, only fulfilled the acute kidney injury using the creatinine values. Once again, highlighting the difficulty of using creatinine as a marker for athletes. And really, those, those participants that had an acute injury had much higher sodium losses as well as water losses in sweat. So 23 participants, very small group, as I said, 55% had the acute kidney injury. But very importantly to note is if you look at the sweat volume within the acute kidney injury group, that group lost 3.8 liters of sweat compared to the group that didn't have an acute kidney injury, which only lost 1.6 liters. So showing a marked difference between those runners that are susceptible to acute kidney injury and those that were not susceptible. 
So then looking further, how does heat also impact acute kidney injury in the setting with marked exercise? So this was a lab study that was set up in a humidified chamber, and they did a two-hour exercise in 39.7 degrees heat with 3% humidity. They did this exercise four times. The first time, the participants were given water to remain eu-hydrated. The second time, they had upper, continuous upper body cooling. The third time, they had both water and cooling. And then the fourth time was just their control group. And they, they just were um, no water, no cooling from them. And what they noticed is that the control group definitely had increased hypothermia and dehydration. And they had the highest urinary biomarkers for acute kidney injury. And so their final outcomes was that acute kidney injury, the risk was much higher when you had dehydration combined with physical activity in heat. So looking at marathons and um, looking at the overall systematic reviews, there have been 11 separate case reports that contain 27 athletes. These were all athletes who had severe acute kidney injury that needed hospitalization. And the main risk factor identified within that group was non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. Furthermore, there were 30 studies that had participants um, in marathons and ultramarathons. Of those, the mean creatinine rise would fall within an acute kidney injury definition. Those studies that did have biomarkers found also that generally there was a rise in biomarkers. But what the review really noted was that there is no long-term studies about what is the long-term kidney um, injury and what is the long-term kidney disease in these participants. So looking at the physiology and how this actually results in acute kidney injury. So each kidney has a million nephrons and this is what a nephron is and this is the actual individual functional units of the kidney. It is the only place in the body where we have two capillary networks that follow in sequence and the importance of that is this is your first capillary network which is the glomerulus. Anything that would drop the blood flow to the glomerulus will drop the blood flow to the rest of the kidney and would affect the kidney function. And at any point in time, the kidney is filtering 25% of your cardiac output. So other than removing waste products, the kidney is really important for blood pressure control through what we call the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. And it is also important in ensuring that tissues are oxygenated and that is done through erythropoiesin or EPO. So under normal physiological situations, you have blood flow that goes through the glomerulus and it enters using the afferent arteriole and the efferent arteriole. That will cause the glomerular filtrate to form, which contains fluids, electrolytes, solutes, and metabolic waste. And this forms through the filtration barrier. The, form the formation of that filtrate is what makes that GFR glomerular filtration rate. So in terms of summing it up, it is the glomerular filtration rate is based on what your water pressure is within the capillary minus the water pressure that is here in the Bauman's capsule. And that is your filtrate that then drains and becomes uh, urine. When you look at the equation to calculate this, this would be Starling's equation, and it is essentially the water pressure minus your oncotic pressures. But to make it really simple for everyone to understand, we're just going to be looking at what is your water pressure in the glomerulus minus the water pressure in your Bauman space. And the Bauman space water pressure should generally be very low because urine is constantly flowing to the bladder. And that means essentially, particularly in athletes, the main glomerular filtration rate is literally caused by a change between the afferent artery and the efferent artery. So any changes to these two arteries will change what your kidney function is. 
So anything that would narrow the blood flow going in will drop the glomerular filtration rate. Anything that would then, oh, apologies, dilate the efferent artery would also drop the glomerular filtration rate. And anything that would decrease your plasma or the blood flow entering would also decrease your glomerular filtration rate. Oh. Sorry, technical glitch. <laughs> okay. So to look at topics that would affect the plasma entering the afferent arterial. This is going to be where dehydration plays a role in dropping your glomerular filtration rate. And things like diuretics will also affect that as well as people who are shot. So in terms of if people have heat stroke, that will also drop the glomerular filtration rate. Things that affect the flow through the afferent arterial would be your anti-inflammatories, rhabdomyolysis, and that is particularly from the myoglobin, as well as your steroids. So um, androgenic steroids in particular, all constrict and narrow that artery, and that drops the glomerular filtration rate. And things that will narrow the afferent and dilate the efferent are drugs such as ACE inhibitors. So really important to consider in those athletes that have high blood pressure. So now that we've seen how it impacts the kidney and actually how it drops the kidney function and how it drops the glomerular filtration rate, dehydration will have that impact because you're dropping the amount of plasma that flows into each and every single nephron. So ordinarily, you would start with normal total body water in any physical activity and you dehydrate over time. The longer you have the physical activity, the more you'll dehydrate. Certain sports, you may actually start dehydrated and that is in particular weight class sports or if you have really short intervals between sessions. So if you were to train late in the evening and early in the morning. And then importantly to consider people who have diuretics on board. So the different types of dehydration that you get, you can have dehydration with a high sodium, and that means that you lose water in without a portion of um, salt loss. And then the other way is that you have salt depletion dehydration, and that is what we were also discussing last week, which is exo-associated hyponatremia as well, where you can have large salt losses along with a large water loss. But no matter what type of dehydration you have, the physiology and performance consequences are the same. So in terms of what the performance consequences are, you will have an increased core temperature, you have an increased heart rate, and you'll also have an increased perceived exertion. Dehydration more than 2% does affect aerobic exercise. It also affects cognitive and mental performance, particularly in sports that require skill tasks, tactics, and concentrations. This can be aggravated in both hot and cold environments. So they generally think that dehydration has limited or no effects on muscle strength or anaerobic performance, but there is some contradictory studies on that. So looking at dehydration in short versus prolonged exercise, there's a study that compared athletes using exercise in 30 minutes versus doing exercise for 150 minutes. Those in 30 minutes had a low, less than 1% dehydration and had no change in their kidney function. Those doing exercise for more than 150 minutes ended up with almost 3% dehydration. Their GFR using cystatin C, the more appropriate test, was significantly lower. And again, they had biomarkers for kidney injury. And so the study concluded that prolonged exercise with marked dehydration resulted in an acute kidney injury. So when it comes to hydration, we now have a problem. As discussed last week, too much water will drop the sodium and results in poor, poor performance and it can be deadly. Too little water, however, can result in, de can result in dehydration 
and will also cause poor performance and be deadly. So you really need just the perfect amount or the Goldilocks approach to getting your water for an event. And that is a very much an individualized approach and should most probably be done in a more scientific way. So looking at anti-inflammatories, apologies, I don't know why my slide is jumping too far ahead. This is meant to be discussing anti-inflammatories and, um, okay, sorry. So anti-inflammatories, non steroidal anti-inflammatories are one of the commonest um, used uh, painkillers amongst athletes. And in fact, in marathon runners, it is said to be used between 50 and 60% of all participants. The problem with anti-inflammatories is that they decrease the glomerular filtration rates. And this is worsened if the person is dehydrated. And that is actually, as I showed with the physiology pictures, because you get a narrowing of that afferent artery entering the nephron. And then by being dehydrated and dropping the amount of blood flow entering, it's just one hit on top of another hit. Furthermore, anti-inflammatories also impair the ability of your kidney to concentrate or dilute urine. And ultimately, as discussed, it impairs overall kidney blood flow. So when looking at athletes, the number needed to harm using anti-inflammatories is actually really low and is only eight. The classic finding in terms of urine samples is hematuria or blood within the urine. And a lifetime um, count of more than 5,000 pills is more likely to make someone nine times more likely to develop um, end-stage kidney disease and require dialysis. So further when looking at anti-inflammatories, anti-inflammatories have two to 10 times the incidence of adverse events, both cardiovascularly, gastrointestinally, and with regards to the kidneys. Adverse events increase the longer the distance that um, is within a marathon. If you take a higher dose of anti-inflammatories, you will have three times the risk of developing an acute kidney injury. Moderate doses of ibuprofen are actually associated with acute kidney failure, which means a sudden deterioration in kidney function that would require hemodialysis. And then aspirin, diclofenac, and ibuprofen are associated with a dose-dependent adverse event in terms of acute kidney injury. So the higher your dose, the more likely you are to develop an acute kidney injury. So in terms of looking at South African data, so there is a published study that had 332 South African runners over the age of 18. And the use of analgesia was really high at 64%. And 70% used more than one type of painkiller. Really importantly, of the group that used anti-inflammatories, 30% took one anti-inflammatory plus another one. Sorry. In terms of the timing of the anti-inflammatories, 71% use non-steroidals before the event, 50% use them during, and 74% use them after. The source of where they obtained the anti-inflammatory, 90% was over the counter, and 49% had actually been recommended the anti-inflammatories from friends and fellow runners, and 41% had no advice or input from a healthcare provider. So one of the difficulties with anti-inflammatories as discussed right at the start is that there is no real long-term data except in the elderly and none within, the, within athletes or marathon runners. The nearest data that we can find is that from a study that looked at active US Army soldiers over a four year period. The total number of participants that they had was almost 800,000. 85.8% were male. 34% of the active army soldiers in that period of time were prescribed anti-inflammatories. 
and 16% of the whole group were prescribed very high dose anti-inflammatories and the average age was 28.6 years. When looking at the annual outcome excesses per 100,000 individuals, it was significantly high considering the number of people who received anti-inflammatories. In terms of acute kidney injury, the case was 17.6. And for chronic kidney disease, the number was 30. So really showing people within a high intensity exercise environment do develop chronic kidney disease from non-steroidal use. There were significantly higher hazard ratios for both acute kidney injury and chronic kidney disease. And any history of hypertension or rhabdomyolysis was associated with an even higher hazard risk ratio. Males were found to have a hazard risk more than two times um, the average, and age was associated with the strongest predictor of chronic kidney disease, with the age group 40 to 49 years have a five times higher hazard ratio, and greater than 50 years a seven times higher hazard ratio. So moving on to the different supplements. Starting with androgen anabolic steroids, they stimulate the ren angiotensin aldosterone system, which the kidney is heavily involved with. They also enhance the production of endothelium, which is the lining of the kidney. And they really express things we do not want in the kidney, which is profibrotic changes and inflammatory cytokines. So in terms of the kidney, they can be directly toxic to the glomerulus of the kidney. And they can also cause a bile acid nephropathy and that's related to liver dysfunction. You can have renal artery thrombosis because um, androgenic steroids are prothrombotic in that they increase your platelet count. You can also have just individual events of acute kidney injury or worsening of chronic kidney disease. There is a Saudi Arabian study that actually put out that subclinical kin kidney injury can occur with a single dose of androgen anabolic steroids. And for those patients that do develop an acute injury or chronic kidney disease, they generally require prolonged hospitalization with an average time span of 20 to 30 days. In terms of the direct kidney injury and damaging the glomerulus, this can happen under both brief, regular or prolonged use. You get marked protein in the urine. And if the steroids are discontinued, a lot of patients who've developed this do improve their kidney function and they have a reduction in the amount of protein leaked into their urine. However, if they reinitiate the steroids, this whole process returns. And many can develop end-stage kidney disease requiring lifelong dialysis or renal transplant. Looking at creatinine, one of the most controversial topics, most athletes were used to increase muscle strength, lean muscle mass, and also improve high intensity exercise performance. There's a lot of controversy around this topic because there are a few trials that specifically showed that there was no effect on kidney function um, using creatinine. However, there are published case reports where kidneys have been damaged using creatinine. These, however, were people who use very high doses and more than five grams a day. They typically developed an acute kidney injury and that did improve on hydrating once again and stopping the creatinine use. High protein diet, also very controversial. It is considered to be safe as long as one has normal kidney function and has never had any injury to the kidney. It is known to positively affect body composition. And there have been studies that showed that there was no change in kidney function after eight weeks of use. However, if you use a high protein diet and you have an underlying kidney disease, you will accelerate that chronic kidney disease. You'll increase your amount of protein in urine. You will increase the amount of water you lose through the kidneys and you can become dehydrated you lose sodium, you'll also lose potassium, and you are at a higher risk of developing kidney stones. Looking at the different vitamins, 
There are multiple case series that also show high dose vitamin use can impact kidney functions. The vitamins with the highest number of cases are vitamin A, D, and E. Typically, you will develop hypercalcemia, so a high calcium with an acute kidney injuries. And once again, there's an increased risk for kidney stones. So energy drinks, these are reported infrequently. But again, there are cases of an acute kidney injury-induced kidney failure. Um, one interesting case was using Red Bull, where the person had a daily consumption of three liters of Red Bull and their kidney function improved and the AKI resolved on quitting Red Bull. Caffeine, caffeine, an intake less than 400 milligrams is safe. And generally it's thought if you have a single cup of coffee a day, it does actually help prolong kidney function and is good for kidneys. However, very high doses are toxic to kidneys. And those cases that have reported it are um, particularly using pre-workout supplements. In fact, the one case with an 18-year-old boy, the 18-year-old boy died, um, and some had acute kidney failure requiring hemodialysis, and some had um, rhabdomyolysis with an associated acute kidney injury. Looking at just globally natural causes, I put the most common ones, but this list is very, very extensive. And as you can see, there are multiple different types of kidney injuries that occur with multiple different forms. So again, it would be safe for most people if you did not have an associated underlying kidney problem or if you were not using non-steroidals or if you ensured that you were hydrated. But combining them is more likely to cause issues. So looking at studies that looked at combinations of supplements with commercial protein, with creatinine, with anabolic steroids, they found that acute kidney injuries did occur. Again, quite high doses of creatinine and protein. Uh, most of the cases, their renal function all improved on stopping all three. Looking at dietary supplements with recreational drugs and anabolic steroids, there was an entire case series of 40 athletes that had a very rapid drop in their kidney function and their kidney functions all improved on stopping the above. So what are the consequences of an acute kidney injury? So acute kidney injury, formal damage does occur to your kidney, even if your function returns back to normal. And you can get abnormal repair. And this ultimately can result in chronic kidney disease. A paper that came out in 2021 um, has shown that there is a higher risk for kidney cancers, um, and this risk increases per number of acute kidney injury. And it has an odds ratio, particularly for renal cell carcinoma, of 3.48. So it's really important the accumulative acute kidney injury events really causes progressive kidney scarring and will accelerate that progression of kidney disease. And so repeated acute kidney injury is associated with long-term chronic kidney disease. So every single event to the kidney counts. Looking at functional outcomes in terms of kidney function, if you have an acute kidney injury, whether it is resolves within seven days or whether it resolves within three months, you can end up with a normal renal function again, as well as normal functional reserve, so normal urine outputs, or you can end up with a normal glomerular filtration rate or a reduced functional reserve. Overall, you could have a totally reduced kidney function. You could end up with chronic kidney disease that you maintain your renal function, or you can end up with progression of kidney disease where ultimately your kidney function declines and you end up needing dialysis or transplantation. Looking at the non-kidney complications of an acute kidney injury, you end up with high risk for cardiovascular disease. Um, at, in particular, heart attacks, high risk for high blood pressure. You had increased risk for infections, um, worsening diabetic control, 
worsening nutrition, and particularly in the youth, you can have growth disorders. So how important is this topic? So I had just a quick look at my last six months, the referrals that have been sent to me just for a reduction in their kidney function with no other problem noted. 79% had a significant exercise history. This means that they um, competed nationally, did marathons, ultra marathons, and the other were professional athletes. So of my group, 31% have been runners. And of that 31% of the runners, 90% had non-steroidal use. And 67% now all had high blood pressure. When I asked them about their water intake, 50% would have less than 500 mils per any event. And this is of the runners. 10% drank to thirst and 10% drank large volumes of water, more than two liters. So looking at a new idea, which is not this um, thought of just your when your kidney function is less than 60, um, that is age appropriate or is when you should be sent to a nephrologist. They're now discussing that an age appropriate or age adapted GFR should be used about when people should be referred to a nephrologist or a kidney specialist. And this is because as you get older, your kidney function will decline. So we would expect a lower kidney function in people who are older, but we should also expect a much higher kidney function in people who are younger. So the new recommendation is instead of using the blank GFR less than 60, is those who are under 54 years of age, a GFR that is less than 75 is actually age inappropriate and means that there is some underlying kidney problem. Older than 54 to 64 years of age, that there is the appropriate GFR of 60 mils per hour. And then over 65 years of age, the GFR of 45. The reason for these numbers is that this is when your mortality risk due to your kidney function increases. And that is how they determine these numbers. So moving forward. So it's very important to document each event if you have had an acute kidney injury during any race. So if you took anti-inflammatories and you ended up not passing urine for a few hours, that is an injury to your kidneys. It's then important to note what medications, what supplements did you take? What was your water intake during that event? And going forward, definitely to monitor what is your blood pressure because there is an increased risk of developing high blood pressure in time. And really importantly to note for those who are practitioners on the group, that follow-up of these cases is important with maybe looking at what the kidney function is within a three-month period, and also looking if there is protein in the urine or albumin in the urine or any urine changes within that three-month period. If there is, those participants, those athletes do warrant a referral to um, a kidney specialist. So chronic kidney disease, do they need to see a nephrologist? Where is their kidney function? Um, how can we prolong it? What medications are they on? Are there ways, can we change the antihypertensives? Are they on ACE inhibitors? Are they using non-steroidals? Are they using any supplements? Um, looking at what is their fluid intake? What is their salt? Are they on diuretics? And also what other diseases do they have? Are there other long-term problems of kidney injury? So really, in summary, every kidney injury counts. It is really important. Every time um, you develop acute renal failure, those are people who have landed up on dialysis. Those are even more significant in terms of their severity. But every single event is important. Two, looking at drugs, looking at supplements, the combination of dehydration, anti-inflammatory supplements is all additive and makes the impact far worse on kidneys. And lastly, follow-up 
is really important because we only know about chronic kidney disease if we are assessing people or if we are getting athletes to have their kidney function checked, to have their urine checked at three months later, when we can say, yes, this injury has resulted in long-term chronic complications of chronic kidney disease. So everything that you mix in your water, everything that you take in your water has some magic to it. The question is whether it is good, whether it is bad. And that is very, very important in terms of your kidney function because every item you put into your body will have some impact. Thanks very much for listening. Perfect. Thank you very much, Dr. Deval. That was very interesting. I think uh, we all learned a lot. Um, there's a couple of questions that have come through. Um, before I get to them, I'd like to ask you one question um, about, you know, what would your advice be to a runner with uh, one kidney, an endurance runner? So what I would most probably say, one of the best things that they could do is to, and I, I would say consider working with a sports physician in terms of planning and getting a very clear hydration protocol for any race or any event. Um, and that may even require doing a kidney function test before, during, or after a training session, just to determine how more at risk or what are their salt losses, what are their water losses. And that's why I included that new study in that showed people who are more susceptible to getting an acute kidney injury lost almost double the amount of water in volume. Because if you have one kidney, you are already more susceptible um, to having kidney injury in any event itself, but you also only have one. So you need to protect that one kidney. So you need to be far more pedantic about um, how much fluid are you using, losing, how much sweat are you losing, what are your salt losses, so that you don't land up with low sodium on an event which is also dangerous but at the same time you're not dehydrated and you're not causing a kidney injury perfect thank you so some of the questions coming through um so if you need to be taking anti-inflammatories how long before a marathon should you stop so i definitely would stop at least 48 hours before any event. And in terms of need to take anti-inflammatories, I would question that statement in itself because anti-inflammatories, their long-term complications are great, whether it's cardiovascular, gastric, or kidney-wise. They really have huge and very significant um, effects on your kidneys um, and significant effects on your body as a whole. So no one should be on long-term anti-inflammatory use unless it's very, very specific conditions. And that would be someone who has autoimmune disorders such as rheumatoid arthritis or lupus. Um, and even then you would look at them using newer drugs, using biologicals to try and get that under control rather than just continuing long-term on anti-inflammatories. Thank you. Um, to carry on with that, is paracetamol safe to take on the day of a marathon? Yes, paracetamol is safe to take on the day of marathon. It doesn't have any effect with kidneys. I'm um, just bearing in mind, be cautious of the amount that you take because you can end up um, if you overdose with liver dysfunction. So nothing is perfect. Okay, perfect. Or at least, I mean, it, uh, it's an option. Um, David Milner has asked, do the COX-2, so are COXIA type anti-inflammatories, have the same effects on the kidneys as COX-1 and 2, so ibuprofen? So they do, their impact is less, but they still do impact the kidney. And um, as studies progress and as more people use them, we are seeing more outcomes that they still have a negative impact on the kidneys. Okay. Um, why would an athlete present with kidney stones? So athletes with kidney stones, and that is what I raise in it, it depends on what supplements you're using. It very much hydration. So how much water you drink is really important because kidney stones form um, when people are dehydrated. I normally would liken it to, as you see, stalactites forming in caves. 
It's um, or when you have um, school projects for kids, you will have very concentrated urine and it normally adheres to one thing and you have decreased flow. But the main point about it is concentrated urine. So if you're drinking more water, and that is one of the keystone in terms of treatment for kidney stones is water. Um, so that would probably be why I'm more likely an athlete would have kidney stones. Um, they may have underlying um, diseases that could predispose into getting kidney stones, but then if they're becoming dehydrated during events, that would aggravate it and be more likely to develop stones. Okay, so um, chronic paracetamol use, um, does that lead to high blood pressure hypertension later and um, any kind of chronic disease, chronic kidney disease? No, so chronic paracetamol use doesn't really lead to um, high blood pressure or chronic kidney disease. Um, we, uh, most nephrologists are big fans of using paracetamol if any um, one needs paracetamol, we're more likely to prescribe that first. Okay, so we have a question from Dr. Pillay. He says, please advise if you can advise on the following. Would it then be wise to use a combination of GFR and then your creatine and cystatin C as a kidney monitoring tool for renal function? Also, is it preferable prior or post event or in three to six month monthly interval to address accordingly if identified? All right, so with regards to the first question, um, if you look in the NEJM published this week, they um, have given new guidelines in determining GFR. And the most accurate um, calculation is the combination GFR using creatinine and cystatin C. Um, so that is very hot off the press. Um, then two, when I speak about pre-event or post-event uh, testing, I think that is, is if you are trying to determine your own, what has happened to your own kidneys, what has happened to your hydration status, what is your sodium, and that in order to be used in a scientific way of mapping out an individual um, almost program in terms of what do you take during an event. But that in itself is very difficult because it is going to change depending on the weather. And that is why I spoke about heat also having an impact on how much you sweat and on acute injury. The three month one is if you identify someone who has had an event or been part of an endurance event and they have um, developed an acute kidney, they've seen blood in their urine or they stop passing urine for a few hours, those people definitely warrant a follow up um, at three months to look at what their kidney function is at the end of that. Seems like we've lost Belinda. Robin, are there any other questions? It looks like we have Belinda back. Great. Uh, but she's muted. Sorry, apologies. West End never um, seems to disappoint with some form of loss in connectivity <laughs> during these webinars. Okay, I just want to see if there are other questions that need to be asked. I think there was one person that asked, is it safe for someone with pre-existing kidney disease to start running marathons? So the one thing that we know is that exercise is also good for kidney function. And that has definitely been shown across all phases, whether you've got um, chronic kidney disease, whether you're on dialysis or whether you have been transplanted, exercise is good for kidney function. The whole question is, when does that become abnormal? And unfortunately, I do feel like kidneys are almost a little bit sometimes the forgotten organ in terms of exercise because these answers aren't easily available. So my suggestion would be as long as you've got um, 
a good program, as long as your hydration is appropriate for whatever level that kidney, chronic kidney disease is, and to monitor function, because if you start doing marathons and you're seeing a drop in your kidney function, then that most probably then is not for you. And um, you should then consider stopping. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a question. What would your recommendation be for fluid per hour as a guideline, as opposed to drink to thirst? You know, sometimes when I'm running, I'm permanently thirsty. So I probably end up drinking six gallons of water um, so is there a recommendation per hour that has come up in research? So this is the, and this is a difficult one, and this is generally my, um, one of my questions to a lot of the, the sports physicians is because when you look at what research is available, and that's why I chose to highlight that research um, paper that looked at acute kidney injury versus non-kidney injury. And in that paper, you had almost, you literally had double the amount of volume loss in the group that got acute kidney injury. And that's why it is very individualized. And so I'd almost propose instead of having a blanket set rule over this will work for everyone, that there should be a far more scientific approach to looking at your endurance events and say, how much sweat do I lose? because based on how much sweat I lose, then I work out how much fluid I need to take in. And then not only that, just in volume, also looking at how much salt do I lose, because how much salt do I need to take in? Okay, so, okay. Um, you know, there was a situation in 2013 uh, where Comrades was exceptionally hot. And, um, you know, you found a lot of people not finishing the race, um, a lot of people sitting next to, I think it was probably the highest rate of non-finishes in the history of comrades in that heat. What would you be your recommendation to, you know, you've been training your hydration, you've been fueling properly, everything's gone well, suddenly you face, come on race day and you're faced with boiling conditions. What would your suggestion be besides drink to first? Yeah, so my thing here would be, you don't just suddenly decide you're doing comrades and you run it in a month. You've been training and you would have trained in hot weather as well. And, and that is it. So you would know how you performed in hot weather and you know what, how much fluid you took in that training cycle versus how much water you would have taken in when it is a cold day. And so it's really more about saying and suggesting that athletes look at when they are training that they start to say how much water did I use how much um, other supplements did I use for today and then going on and say how did I feel after that did I feel completely flat or did I actually feel good that this was a good training session um, my performance was great mentally I felt great because that also will um, shows us a bit on terms of your hydration status if you've done a training session that's in the heat and you are passing very dark, very concentrated urine or low volumes of urine, you'll know yourself that you haven't had enough water. And that's why I say it's, it's about starting to turn this of just, oh, this is kind of how much I'm going to drink into saying, let me look at what is my weight pre-training, what is my weight post-training. And bearing in mind that when you take those weights, you've got to take off your clothing because your clothing will have the sweat on it as well. So that would impact how much water have I lost? What has been my weight loss in this? Have I lost more than 3%? Have I lost 2%? And, and it's just changing that idea of just going, this is individualized. This is really important. And do I have a plan for when it is hot? Do I have a plan for when it is cold? Because those plans should be different. And it's, it's just, um, it's about being far more individualized and more scientific in an approach. Perfect, thank you. Can I ask a question in terms of just daily stuff? So how important is your daily water intake? So as a marathon runner, so your daily water intake, um, how important is that then for your event? So let's say for argument's sake, you don't drink water as a rule. Suddenly you get to a race, and you now hydrating lovely and taking water. Is it important to maintain your daily water intake over a period of time? 
So it's very important because if you're starting your event dehydrated, you're already on the back foot. So being well hydrated, optimizing your kidney function on a daily basis is going to be crucial for any um, endurance event. Okay, and you mentioned earlier in terms of um, taking, you know, non-steroidals, um, and then it takes a long time for someone to then, go, you know, go to the toilet after a race. In the event of not taking non-steroidal um, or anti-inflammatories, and a person still takes two to three hours or whatever to then go to the bathroom after a race, mm -hmm. is have they been? Is that then dehydration? Yeah, then I would say that much probably is dehydration because there are some other effects that exercise causes on the kidneys during events, but you should be able to still pass some urine during the event and not drinking. You remember your kidney's job is to preserve blood volume. So if you are dehydrated, they are going to do whatever they can to pull fluid in and to um, maintain your blood volume. And so not passing urine is a really negative sign in terms of um, your overall status for that event in, um, and in being behind on fluids. Okay, thank you. Um, last question. Um, if someone's hands tend to swell during an event, what is that a sign of? So <laughs> that can be a sign of quite a few different things. Um, but it's not something that would generally be related to kidneys. Okay, all right. So that's something I kind of thought that might just be a, a bad hydration kind of sign. Okay, so we don't have any more questions. Um, and I think actually it's probably a good time to, to wrap up for the evening. So thank you again, um, Dr. Deval. It was a very interesting discussion um, from our side, obviously. I do believe, and having learned the lesson the hard way, is that if you're having to take painkillers or any form of, of um, NSAID to run, you maybe should not be running, and you should maybe be seeking professional help um, for the pain that you're experiencing rather than causing yourself potential kidney damage. Um, then thank you to everyone for joining us this evening. Um, thank you again to our sponsors, Asina Lita, um, and thank you to Robin, who behind the scenes sets up all the technology for us that um, every now and again goes wrong. Um, <laughs> and I don't know, I think um, Robin is there, uh, I think by Josie next week. We yes, go. that's that's correct. So this is just advertising um, the next uh, webinar that's um, happening next week, Wednesday. Um, please note the different time. It's at 6.30. This is organized by the Johannesburg Orthopedic Sports Institute and the um, Center for Sports Medicine um, and Orthopedics um, and in collaboration with WUSH. So please uh, join us next week. Thank you very much, um, Belinda, for hosting. And a special thank you to Dr. Doval for your insight. It was a fantastic presentation. Thank you very much. Everyone, good night. Thanks, everyone. Cheers. Bye.